Good afternoon, participants. Hi, my name is Javeria, and I am a representative of Faculty of Architecture and Planning, AKTU. I welcome you all to today's webinar with architect Piyush Prajapati. Uh, the topic for today's webinar is the architecture of intelligence and the role of AI and machine learning in architecture. Just to briefly explain what the webinar is about, um, I just give you an introduction. So with the evolution of technology, the society has been changing dramatically. It has never been easier to access medicine, education, transportation, etc. Artificial intelligence, or popularly known as AI, is transforming almost everything connected to human life, such as the economy, language, ethics, security, and etc. However, we are still a few steps behind in incorporating computer cognition with our design methods. Technological tools such as big data analytics, machine learning, AI are empowering designers to explore the unexplored potential of design and construction methods. It is providing an intelligent insight to more efficient design operations, which in turn leads to smarter business design moves, higher gains, and maximum pro productivity. Today's webinar aims to highlight the importance of computational thinking during the design process by understanding and quantifying human-centered design philosophies. About today's speaker, Piyush Prajapati is an award-winning architect and a computational urban designer working in Dubai and India. Born in Bhopal, and he has graduated from our college uh, in 2014 and has also won the best architectural thesis uh, project by the Council of Architecture in 2014. He later on went to pursue masters in machine learning urbanism from Bartlett School of Architecture, UCL London, where he holds the computational award and a medal for his research in 2019. We are very proud to tell you that he also holds felicitation from the President of India and many other international podiums. He is also an advisory member of IJMAR, International Journal for Multidisciplinary Research. His design research is currently running an exhibition at the Pompidou Center, Paris, under the name of, uh, under the theme, Simulated Intelli Intelligence Neurons. He also holds expertise in artificial intelligence and its role in design and architecture. His main works focus upon the amalgamation of computer intelligence and human intelligence to yield better design results. So I now welcome Piyush to the webinar. Hi Piyush, how are you doing? Hi Javaria, thank you so much. Uh, I'm doing I'm doing well, thank you. It's so good to see you. It's so good to have an alumnus with us uh, presenting for our students and colleagues. Well, to be honest, the pleasure is all mine. Uh, uh, I've been trying to do that for quite a while now, and I think uh, things are actually taking place. So I'm glad. It, it's I'm quite humbled as well. Okay, so I'm not going to take away much time from the participants, and I'm just going to connect you with them. Uh, and uh, I would request you to begin your presentation now. I'll uh, agree. Just send you. It. Okay, uh, so good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone is doing okay and uh, are well at their respective events. Uh, thank you again for such an amazing introduction. Well, as said uh, before as well, I completed my bachelor's from FOA in the year 2014, and I'm really looking forward to today's webinar. Well, I would like to thank the faculty and the dean for this opportunity uh, to have conversation with you all. Uh, it feels very great. And I think it is a great initiative to keep us all connected virtually, especially during this time of pandemic. And I hope this webinar would help in bringing some fresh and new perspective towards design and architecture. So today's topic of discussion and uh, webinar is architecture of intelligence, uh, identifying the importance and the role of AI in machine learning and architecture. Before we dig in deep into artificial intel intelligence, I would uh, like to highlight the timeline of architecture with respect to design invention, design theories, and architectural innovation. In the year 1930, the era of modularity came into picture, uh, where we saw a few amazing concepts in design. 
the very first argument on smart architecture was stated by Walter Gropius, where he spoke about using computers in architectural design. And soon after that, we came across modular system of anthropometry by Le Corbusier in the year 1945. And in, an interesting inference is that by unifying both the ideas and concepts, uh, Mose Schaub, they designed Habitat 67 in Montreal, Canada. The housing complex is one of the most admired building of the modularity phase, and it is still praised by many. But the Dartmouth Summer Research Project on Artificial Intelligence was a 1956 summer workshop, widely considered to be the founding event of artificial intelligence as a field. The project lasted approximately six to eight weeks and was essentially an extended brainstorming session. 1960 onwards, the era of computational design emerged where we saw invention of sophisticated computer programs such as AutoCAD and CATIA by Frank Gehry, also known as Gehry Technologies. Uh, Christopher Alexander spoke about pattern language in architecture and MIT came up with the first ever chatterbox in the year 1966. Well, honestly, I don't want to bore you with the dates and the list of theories, but uh, here's the interesting catch. The era of parametricism came in the year 1990, where we witnessed some of the amazing projects like uh, Vitra Fire Station by late Zaha Hadid and the invention of Grasshopper as a designing tool in the year 2007. But now we have already passed the era of parametrics and we are currently in the period of artificial intelligence. Well, we did have a couple of major developments, but not much has been explored on this particular phase. And one of the major breakthrough in architecture of intelligence is the application of neural network in, in designing. I think this, oh yeah, okay, the slides are working now. Basically, the neural network is the series of algorithm that aims to draw relationship from complex data sets through a process by mimicking the functioning of human brain Thus, it is also called as artificial brain. And the generative design philosophies in neural network came in the year 2014. Well, the neural network is quite complex and it is a strong subject in itself. So detailing it out would be a matter of a separate webinar. So for now, let, let's just get into the state of mind that the neural network is basically the part or the subset of artificial intelligence to simplify it. The neural network is a pattern recognition algorithm which you use to unlock your smartphones by your face ID or in object detection. So without deviating from the main theme, I would like to pull in the first slide again and break down the topic in a couple of important keywords. And let's get straight to the point where we can address the elephant in the room, AI, machine learning and architecture. Well, architects are not sure what to think about artificial intelligence. Uh, you are probably very familiar with how AI will change industries like cybersecurity, medicine, and manufacturing. Well, how about architecture? This brings us to three important questions. What, why, and where of art architecture of intelligence? So AI is basically the intelligence displayed by machines and software. Today, AI is all around us. If you own a smartphone, tablet, PC, or even a car, it is very likely that it runs on some form of AI, be it Siri, Cortana, or even Google Maps. The ever-growing connection of people via technology is enabling a more open and transparent look into every person's life. Now let's understand why it is important in architecture. By knowing what we like, what we post online, what do we buy and where we go are smartphone, tablets and computers through a complex algorithm know us empathically better than we do ourselves. The data is constantly being uploaded onto a cloud. Information gain can be analyzed by an AI to automatically generate plans. The plan can then be improved later on by architects and planners and designers and the result of which could be a completely finished design. To give you an easier example, let's look at the Tesla cars. They all have AI pilots in the car and with every journey, the car uploads the data to a cloud server. 
This data is mainly about road congestion, road openings, and commute time, something which is very similar to Google Maps. So that the next car that comes on the street has now, up, has now the updated information on what routes to choose. And the way we architects can benefit from it is by analyzing this very data set, you might come up with a very simple solution of a roadblock or a heavy traffic, where just by increasing the road width by one meter, you could solve the urban problem rather than by building or proposing a whole new flyover. And thirdly, their application is quite vast as well. By already knowing everything about us, our hobbies, likes, dislikes, activities, friends, our yearly young income, AI software can calculate population growth. It can prioritize projects. It can categorize streets and according to the usage and so on. And thus it can predict a virtual feature, future and automatically draft urban plans that best represents and suits everyone. Basically, shaping the future design environments. Well, it all looks fancy, but how do we do it, right? How do we get into a right mindset of using such principles and ideas in architecture and design? What are the ways we can truly understand computer cognition? By cognition, I mean intelligence. These are the few questions you might think upon. And as I said initially as well, the aim of this webinar is to let you guys explore the unexplored potential of this field. Having said that, let's jump to the interesting part, the process. Let's assume we have an architectural design or a problem. In the initial step, we would like to include the learning from theories and building up the understanding of design problem. Let's say we have to design a housing complex. You would then start analyzing and researching about different types of housing, definition of housing, and then you would gather up a collaborative understanding of it. In the next step, we would start drawing inferences from the site at micro and macro levels, that is at the site and the city level. Here, we would bring up understanding of road network, connectivity to the housing complex, potential entry exit points and its impact on the society. Upon gathering all the necessary information about design problem, the next crucial step is to create an algorithm that can understand all the parameters you would state. In simple terms, we would state the list of arguments which would derive the design. Let's call them design parameters. Now here is the interesting bit. Based on your list of design parameters, there are infinite number of design possibilities on how we can orient the building where we should propose the door or window openings or what should be the ideal internal and external circulation. Hello. Sorry for the inconvenience, uh, the network issues at uh, the go to webinar host is a little uh, creating a little issues. I we sorry we're back online. I hope you are able to hear us and everyone. If somebody is having any audio issues, kindly just leave us a message in our chat box and we'll resolve it. Uh, meanwhile, Piyush, are you back online? Yeah, I'm back online. Uh, not sure when the session got uh, ended. Yeah, uh, we're really, really sorry for uh, the connectivity issues. Uh, I just sent uh, you again a request for presenter. Yeah. Are you able to see my screen now? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. OK, great. I um, honestly have no idea when when I, when I lost you guys. So if you can tell me uh, which slide we were talking about, I can probably start from there. Uh, you were at slide 20. You were at slide 20. 
पैरामीटर ट्यूनिंग ओके कूल सो आई प्रोबली स्टार्ट अगेन फ्रॉम योर so uh okay again i'm so sorry guys uh we we kind of had some technical issues so i'll get back on the topic so as i was saying here is the interesting bit based on your list of design parameters there are infinite number of design possibilities on how we can orient the building where we should propose the door and window openings or what should be the ideal internal and external circulation while doing it all by human mind it will probably take months to determine the right design option what computer intelligence would do is it will take all the listed design parameters it will understand them and it will compute to give you one from, from from the million possibilities now instead of brainstorming over million of design possibilities which usually take up a huge amount of time we would now have computationally driven design solutions let's assume some 5 to 6 option which would satisfy all the listed parameters and as a designer your role is to choose the right one tailored to your aesthetics this process is called as form finding where you are determining the form of the building by computationally driven methods now you may think if the computer is doing the job what is the role of designers right well if you have to record the number of possibilities of uh, different design iteration here is a screen recording of a very basic ai model where the form where the form is broken down into various modules to find the best design solution for housing complex now my question is how much time would you take to derive the right answer in this case it took 56 minutes so the ai would is not going to take up our jobs rather it would act as a catalyst in finding the right solution for the design well honestly computer is a dumb machine what it is good at is its computing skill which usually humans lack and it is important as designers and architect to identify the right balance between the two an ai would just give us a form and it is the role of designer to sculpt the emotion out of it at max it would give you some 5 to 6 best design possibilities but it is in hands of architect to shape the final vision here is an example of the selected form and the same form can be tailored to numerous design languages be it the housing complex done by mose shahde or the community housing by brak angels the final product would always reflect and is always backed up by a strong research done by computer intelligence or ai now here is an example of another computationally driven floor plan where the aim is to increase the productivity of the office layout it is done by enhancing the spatial and visual connectivity sorry the screen was stuck okay so it is done by enhancing the spatial and visual connectivity by manipulating the internal wall partitions and the furniture layout the ai calculates the desired number of meeting rooms the area required per seat and even the total capacity of the floor now let's have a look at another form finding example the mixed use project aim in developing the form with the computational measures the final form would look something like this and i'll highlight the reasoning behind it keeping in note of the excess route the site also has direct connection to the water feature in the very first process of optimization the goal of ai algorithm is to identify the right location of the building form so that all the towers can have maximum views in the second stage of optimization the ai calculates the right orientation of the building to improve the visual connectivity thirdly the form is then studied for sun movement and solar radiation the parameters over here is to reduce the solar gain and increase the daylight factor the factor of mutual shading is also considered here lastly the build forms are then analyzed and tested for wind intake the atriums and the opening are strategically placed 
and oriented to make most of the wind movement. The same exercise is actually done for all the towers. And upon optimizing all the above parameters, the final build form would look something like this. The computationally driven form is thus the right amalgamation of human and computer intelligence. Having said that, I would also like to show you an example of a real time design solution that has been executed and tested on the site. The project I'm going to talk now, uh, show you now is Alsif Dubai. It is a mixed use stretch of about 1.8 kilometers, having residences, retail and commercial spaces. And the design is basically inspired from traditional soup buildings of this region, having wind towers and niche courtyard spaces. Since the site is located next to the waterfront, one of the main criteria while designing the stretch was to enhance the public movement and visual connectivity to appreciate the spaces and the waterfront promenade. Upon having the general master plan, it was important for us to monitor the building height so as to build the character without being hindrance to the views. We then created a machine learning algorithm to find the right to find the right balance of the both to achieve the best building skyline. Here is a video highlighting the numerous design possibilities after generating the right, right model. I would like to show you the final result. And here are some professional shots of the building. The promenade and the quality of the building form. The traditional architecture style where each house or building within the project has story of its own. Some buildings are designed to look as if they were built in 1960s with darker wall, less lighting and simple, decor simple decorative elements, while others have the light walls with much more intricate details. Moving forward, I would like to briefly talk about my research project on urban design. The project name is Neural Network Public Places, also known as N Square P Square. The research aims at redefining the experience and the design of public spaces in the age of artificial intelligence. The soul of research project is based on big data. Well, big data is considered as one of the best byproducts of 21st century. Almost everything we do produces data from swiping credit cards to emailing liking photos on Facebook and requesting directions from the Google map. Big data today is acting as a bread and butter of AI algorithms and computational thinking. Well, this term is even dominating in the field of design just because it reveals human patterns. When data sets are read and analyzed in bulk, it reveals inner human sociology. For example, the data set gathered from Google Maps would reveal how we humans interact with spaces, the connectivity, and how do we, on what logic we choose the routes. These data would then help in determining better urban spaces. Also, the GPS system and location-based services gives access to an important amount of data that is currently being used mostly for traffic analysis but which, if properly processed, could open up an infinite possibilities for planning. The research project even took the broader perspective of the city by analyzing at my macro level upon overlaying important urban fabrics such as building heights, residential and commercial areas, green spaces, density map of the city and the city buildings and the choice map. The map basically reveals the deeper finding of the city. Choice map is again an AI algorithm to calculate the possibility of you selecting a specific route. For example, it is known that all the roads are interconnected to each other. Some act as primary roads and some are secondary and tertiary road network. Given a chance that you might go anywhere without any direction, the choice map would highlight the important road connections no matter which direction you take. You would end up going, taking those important road network connections. 
after establishing the importance of road network, the next biggest thing was to measure the quality of an environment. The quality of any environment can be easily judged by mapping what you like to see and what you avoid seeing. By using AI, we can also map how much area can be seen from a specific point. This again will infer a lot about spaces and characteristics of public spaces, promenades, or even gullies. Mapping it on a city level, the research explores the visual preferences to measure and judge the quality of spaces. On your right, you may see a graph representing the visual areas for the selected routes. Now that we have already determined the importance of road network, the next important step is to map the human movement. Let's say you have to go from point A to point B. There are 100 different ways you may choose your route and all of them would give you different characteristics. So which one is the best? The research aims to build the comparison between the human navigation and the navigation chosen by an AI model. It is inferred that there are a lot of unforeseen factors which determine the human movement. So you may find a chart wala on your way and you might take a detour to your destination. So here is the prototype of a model where an AI navigates by learning, finding mistake and resolving it to find the best possible route to reach the destination. The final result lead to the shortest route to the destination with the best visual environments. Here is the comparison between the two navigation models the human navigation and the navigation by AI agent. I then calculated the urban fabric with respect to human movement. The easier way to do it is to divide the city into smaller cells or grids. I thus calculated the number of people stepping in a particular grid. How much time duration do they spend on one grid and what is the dominant direction of their movement? The overall comparison of three data sets can be seen here. The major inferences being what usually seems obvious is never the obvious. Some of the secondary and tertiary road networks of the city, which are probably not very important routes, are actually one of the best routes to commute. So upon interacting with the city by movements, the social media these days is also an essential parameter to quantify the space, that is to measure and learn about the space. For example, there are places in the city you would prefer going to and click pictures, be it Imam Bara, be it Chalk or even Hazrat Ganj. The reason we interact with these spots is because these places have a unique spatial and urban characteristics. Now, there are tools of design where we can map social media impressions and it would tell us the exact location where the pictures were taken. If we collect over 10,000 pictures and map their geolocation, the city will start revealing interesting characteristics, which I believe cannot be perceived by human brain. In the video, you may see the red notes. These are the points from where the pictures were taken and uploaded on social media with their specific hashtags. It is now even possible to monitor the emotion behind these pictures by reading and analyzing the keywords. The density of these nodes highlight the favorable areas of the city. Architecturally speaking, if you want to build a shopping mall or tea stall or even any consumer based model, now as a designer, we are capable enough to identify the right location for better businesses and interaction with the city and the city inhabitants. Here is an overlook of the computational brain I created to understand the city fabric on the parameters we just discussed. The aim of the brain is to identify the pattern 
within these parameters to establish a design language. The parameters that are being computed here are human movement, social media impressions, building volumes, and the colors from the social media images. Over here, the research highlights a particular area of the city which needs to be redesigned. In the initial process, the human movement is identified, followed by their visual preferences. The artificial brain then suggests the desired form tailored to the site. The research here celebrates the distributed and dynamic qualities of big data, which is utilized to generate spatial layouts that are able to take advantage and to respond to various local and global inputs, environmental concerns, and the desires of the residences. Here is the cross section of the site with the built form suggested by an artificial brain. The form here is manipulated the buildings catering to the human needs and their preferences. Another visual highlighting the AI visionary space. It suggests that the form here is the right prototype with flawless human movements and the space is socially well connected. Well, in order to test the artificial brain I created, it was important to test the algorithm on the other parts of world and cities as well. Up till now, the data collection, the city fabric and the test were specifically done on London. To monitor the authenticity of the AI algorithm, I tested it on Paris, more specifically on the island of Notre Dame. Well, after the Notre Dame fire, I thought it would be interesting to pay some uh, AI tribute. The build form that you see here is not to be confused by the final design output. Consider them as a general massing, and it is usually in the hands of designer to cultivate aesthetics out of it. I was fortunate enough that my research project was selected and presented as an exhibit at Pompidou Center Paris this year, along with some other elite projects such as Morpheus by Zaha Hadid and Rafik and it all's Melting Memories. Well, I would like to end with a small simulation I carried out on our college, and I would like to call this as AI for FOA. Having said that, I would like to demonstrate the role of uh, role and participation of AI in the space we all are aware of, the administrative building of Faculty of Architecture. My aim in this exercise is to establish and illustrate the spatial connectivity within this building. To the left, you may identify the committee room and the principal office, and to the extreme right, you may see the student spaces such as thesis studio and lecture room. Upon running the simulation of spatial connectivity, you may see the corridor is acting as a spine of the building. The areas marked red and orange are the spaces with the maximum spatial and visual connection, and the area color coded with blue and dark blue are in isolation. That is, these spaces are not very well connected. You may also notice the pockets of deep red nodes. These are basically the intersection zones with high, highest spatial connectivity as they are either intersected by a door opening or another perpendicular corridor. Well, you would also notice a difference in these two zones, the Thapur Hall and the computer lab. Clearly, the AI model suggests that the computer lab falls under the blue zone and it is not spatially connected even though the rooms are almost similar dimensions. Analyzing the plan now, you may identify the big difference being the door opening. What if we propose another opening on the other side of the lab? Would it affect the spatial and visual connectivity? So let's try that. Upon running the AI simulation again with an additional door this time, in the new spatial connectivity, both the rooms have equal importance. They are spatially more connected and you would end up interacting with both the spaces almost equally. 
And let's add another dimension to it. Let's assume you have to go from your thesis studio to principal's office. Point A being the starting point and point B being, B being the destination. The AI simulation here is calculating the characteristics of your vision. What are the areas you would see while going from point A to point B? Let's assume you have you had to take a detour to catch up with one of your friends on your way and then you head back. You may note the change in the visual areas. This analysis would be interesting to determine the opening and the wayfinding. And if you were allowed to move in the space freely and aimlessly in the above diagram of human movement, it suggests that you would end up going to the library. The spatial composition of the building determines that no matter what, the highest footfall is in the library. That is the area uh, in red. The spatial composition, well, I already said that. So you'll end up going to the library followed by the long corridor, the topper hall and the thesis studio. So maybe the next time when you visit the admin block, when the lockdown ends, uh, there are good chances that you might end up going to the library or at least in that direction. So that's all for today's session on role and importance of AI in architecture. Well, if you guys found this session interesting uh, and would like to know more about the workings of AI algorithm, please feel free to get in touch by Instagram, Facebook or Gmail. And uh, I've also conducted a couple of AI boot camps and workshop named Arcovis, where the aim of the workshop is to promote computational thinking. It is usually three to four days long where the students are exposed to the direct ap applications of whatever we discussed today. So cheers guys, stay home, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you so much Piyush for explaining uh, the role of AI in architecture. I think you've uh, gone down to the elemental level and explained it so clearly that uh, it is no more us. There, I, I hope there will no more be a stigma in the audience's mind and uh, they will hopefully be uh, looking forward to, you know, incorporating uh, computational design in their design thinking. Uh I'm, I'm glad it came out that way because when we usually talk about AI, uh, we end up uh, getting into probably so much technical that we usually lose the charm of uh, uh, emotion or aesthetics. So uh, again, as I said, it was more to create an exposure, what is happening in the field of AI and uh, architecture with respect to architecture. And it will be a success if we can incorporate the same in uh, design philosophies as well. Yep, yep, you're right, you're right. So we've already opened the portal for questions and we have the first question from one of uh, your um, former professors, uh, Ritu Ma'am. Ritu Ma'am is asking that uh, does AI only respond to visual sensations in urban spaces uh, as photos and uh, pics are primarily uh, visual and less emotional or sensorial? So how uh... do you I think what she's trying to ask is how do you capture the emotion and the sensorial content uh, just from the images? Okay, so uh, I'll probably answer this question in two different parts uh, from the question. Well, thank you, Ritam, for the question, first of all. And uh, secondly, um, when we talk, okay, so in the example that I was giving, I was mainly talking about the visual connections and capturing the visual information. Well, it is possible to cater to different kind of uh, 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 to explore beyond the visuals as well. I mean, you don't have to always get into, let's say, um, pictures. That's the reason I was talking about the hashtags as well. For example, when we upload a picture on a social media, be it Instagram or uh, uh, Facebook or Flickr or anywhere, we usually give the hashtags. We usually state if we like the picture, what is the emotion behind this picture? Now you might add some sarcasm to your hashtags as well. Not really that if I'm saying that I'm, uh, I feel very happy in this picture, it, it could be a kind of a sarcasm. But again, when we look at the picture in scale of hundred thousands and out of that, at least 50 to 60% is relatable. I think from using the hashtag, it is easier for us to grab the emotion of the picture behind it. And then when you map it on the geolocation, you somehow get to see, uh, let's say, I'll give you an example of chalk. 
I take some thousand pictures and uh, for the hashtags, a lot of people say it's pretty crowded, right? So we know the fact since we've been there, uh, we know the place is quite crowded, but for computer, it's just quite an unknown uh, dimension. So let's say out of thousand pictures, 600 or 700 pictures says that it is crowded. The computer start getting the, like probably draws the inference that uh, the emotion or let's say the spatial quality of the space is crowded in nature. So that's how we can probably get the emotion, emotional question of the pictures and the spaces as well. Okay, so basically the captions and the hashtags associated with every post that goes online can also be quantified to sort of develop a emotional and sensorial aspect of the space. Exactly, that's one way of uh, doing it as well. There is another way where you can explore is the way you take uh, or probably the direction where you go. I mean, uh, yeah, that's one of the parameters, but then I have to go quite deep in order to explain that. But uh, the way uh, we choose our direction, the way we, ch we choose to go from point A to point B also illustrate a lot about uh, the emotional question of the space. Like you have 10 different things back in your mind. Why are we, you choosing that particular route? Uh, yeah. So yeah, then you'll have to basically go really deep into cognitive psychology. And I think every design or every research problem has its layers. So depending on the depth of your research problem, you need to uh, address the layers accordingly, right? Exactly, exactly. I hope I was able to answer the question. Okay, so if she has something to add, I guess, ma'am, please uh, let us know. Uh, the next question that we have is from Yogen Singh. He is asking, what are the skill sets required to understand and practice AI in architecture? How should a student proceed with this idea to induce any AI lead? So I'm guessing okay. what he's trying to ask is, uh, what is the first step for a student? Okay, so the very first step for anyone to probably process the, the AI thinking is to uh, rationalize the whole problem. Like I was given an example of a housing, right? So you, you break down all the parameters. Usually what we do is, we end up sketching a lot of steps. Like we we uh, do the steps in order how we should probably be processing the whole design. Like we study about the housing and then we do a couple of case studies and then we try to replicate our own uh, understanding out of it and then we design. So all these steps can actually be broken down in computer language as well. So uh, you can actually translate this in form of uh, AI scripting which you can do it either by Grasshopper. Now it is also possible to do it in SketchUp as well. Like they have a plugin called Ruby uh, where you can actually code on SketchUp as well. It's as simple as that. And you can develop multiple generative designs out of it. And that's probably one of the initial steps where you try to rationalize all your design arguments or your design uh, questions, let's say, in terms of coding where you can actually, we are asking computers to give you the answer. So that's the initial step where you can uh, get AI into your design. So uh, I guess basically you need to have the logical sequences to your questions and the variables and then start uh, after you assemble all these logical sequences that you want to build uh, from, for your design problem. And then you can probably start scripting Ruby script. Exactly. I mean, Ruby script, if you are using uh, SketchUp, then there is Grasshopper, uh, if you're using uh, uh yeah. then you can even do it if you're using a gaming platform you can you can do it by unity as well like there there are n number of softwares if you're good with uh, revit you can do it by using dynamo that's one of their uh, supporting application but yeah thanks for simplifying what i said so that's that's <laughs> the whole point uh, okay, so we have another question uh, from Anshima Khare. Uh, she's asking, there are other factors that affect a design, uh, like maybe a space that that does not need much visual connectivity as other spaces. So can we do the reverse? Like, can, so can we control the AI over for such parameters as well? Like how? Yes, it is. The... Sorry, you were saying something. Like how you were showing the example, like how to maximize connectivity, you uh, created a design build. Uh, so can we do the reverse? Like, so, you know, for spaces that do not need connectivity, uh, can we develop yes, algorithms? Yes that's, yes, that's the whole point. I mean, uh, what computer is going to do is it'll give you the results. And it is, again, your call how you want to address that particular problem. For example, 
my aim was to probably maximize the visual connectivity your aim could be where you could you, you just want to address the blue zones i was talking about the red zone and the blue zone right the red zone being more connected and the blue zone is quite uh, let's say private and intimate so maybe instead of creating or adding an additional door you are actually removing the doors so it's again based on the parameters it'll give you the results but it's again your call where you can if you want to let's say maximize the view or you want to uh, eliminate the views it's definitely the call of designers and architects it is totally okay. possible well yeah but again coming, again coming back to you have to build your uh, case scenario and develop the sequence according to that basically exactly. again it comes, it comes back to that when you talk about AI and uh, machine learning, it's all about the parameters. It's all about the arguments that you create. It's all about the statements that computer can understand. So usually when we analyze any problem, it's, it's always about uh, why are we doing this? How are we doing this? What are the list of things that I should probably, the checklist basically. So those checklists should be trans, or let's say, should be converted into some kind of parameters that a computer can understand. So you have 10 different ideas, right? You try to sketch something out on the butter sheet of paper and then uh, you come up with a design or something. But again, what you're trying to do in an AI platform is you again list all the parameters. Instead of sketching it out, this time you're making computer to give you all the, all the options possible, right? And then you might sketch 10 different options, but in the same time, computer can give you 100,000 different options. And now you have 100,000 options and from those options, you can probably choose which one you would like to go forward with. And then instead of brainstorming to five more ideas and investing time there, the time you spend in brainstorming can now be utilized in order to create or build more aesthetics and logical reasoning behind all these uh, design evolutions. So that's how AI is helping architecture. It's reducing your time in order to, uh, I, mean, I, I think I think I made it clear rather than I, I hope. Um, I mean, I, just to simplify it even further for the students, I can just like, you know, um, maybe add to it and say that uh, if you have like, you know, a design problem, you when you start with a concept, you have a vision that like what you're designing, right? And then you choose a couple of parameters like you want to have. Uh, okay, I'm going to go back to your example of the uh, Altif uh, master plan and uh, mention that like you chose to have maximum visual connectivity you chose to have uh, you know uh, optimum um, uh, volume so these are the uh, goals that we try and achieve in our design so once we list out these goals i think from there we start uh, we that's the parameters we feed for the ai script and then from there it builds the mass for us yes so, to, uh, for a student to approach AI, uh, to uh, you know, to use AI as a tool in their design uh, process, it would be for them, like, they'll have to sort of build the list of uh, priorities they want to have in your design and from there use the other priorities to develop a mass, right? Exactly. For some, it could be building heights. For some, it could be, let's say for me, it was a visual connectivity. For some, it could be, uh, I don't know, uh, spatial connectivity, anything. It's, it's, it's an open-ended uh, uh, question. You can possibly come up with 10,000 uh, different parameters. Yeah. Exactly. You can have any number of combinations of these possibilities. And depending on the priority that you want to keep for your design, you can come up with uh, numerous iterations, I believe. Okay, so moving on, uh, I think uh, there's one more question from uh, Pranav Kashyap. He is asking that uh, the simulations that you created for spatial movements or aesthetic view, uh, what tool were you using to create them? Okay, so uh, talking about the visual connection and the tools, basically those were scripted on uh, Grasshopper. That's, that's one way to do it. And I've also used the gaming platform in order to get the AI agent mindset. I mean, I'll give you a very simple example. When we usually pay, play a game, right? So usually the best simulation of an AI agent can be done on any of the gaming platforms because uh, you know which direction your character is moving. You can actually, like for example, you're going somewhere, then you die and then you start back again, right? So there's a learning phase that happens in that particular game. So that's 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 probably on a, that's like a, a let's say an advanced level of uh, uh, mapping the human movement, but the very initial basic uh, movement of human can be done on Grasshopper as well. That is again like uh, Rhino, Rhinoceros. Okay, okay. I hope I, it answers Pranav's question. Um, there is an interesting question from Aadhar Kashyap. 
so he's saying uh, basically there are some applied tools for ai in architecture that need to be used uh, as running simulations requires a huge database to achieve desirable confidence level so it will be a huge costing for individual architects as data purchases and cloud capabilities are expensive so what are your thoughts on that like how hard will it be for individual architects uh okay so honestly every organization or let's say every if if i want to uh, okay so what i'll tell you what i have done uh some countries some cities have a very strong database and these are basically open source database which we can use which any architects any developer any coder can use so a uh, lot of i mean i don't know how's the how's the condition back in india where the cities would have that kind of database but again there are sensors there are uh, open source data websites where you can grab the data uh, there's one data that i'm pretty sure and it is available to all is the google map data basically so if you want to map the human navigation it is possible to do so just by uh, uh, creating a cloud account on your google and you can you just have to you access through an api and you can get all the human movement if we are talking about human movement uh gathering data about social media is also possible now since uh, a lot of people are actually uh, uploading uh, pictures on instagram and facebook and uh, what not so again using a specific ai and getting the permissions uh, is is very, is kind of easy these days now so i think it is possible to get and probably access the data through open source website rather than investing a huge amount of data but i guess for this, the upcoming cities we are talking about uh, smart cities well ideally these cities should be built where you have enough amount of data already there or maybe they have a setup they have a cloud where they have a provision in order to uh, accumulate all bulk of data so that it can be used for the benefit of the city it's like when i when i gave an example of uh, tesla car so you should have a cloud you should have a backup already existing so that the you can the future can benefit from it exactly i mean i think uh, tesla technologies has already uh, given an open challenge to the world that their firmware and their data is available for free for everybody and uh, i exactly. think what what their cars are mapping the the road connectivity and the condition of roads and uh, talking about transport infrastructure the what data tesla is producing is like gold for the world like you know especially for yeah. america so uh, yeah i mean uh, i'm sure like you know uh, we coming under the category of like you know developing countries soon india will have its own databases and data sets but currently i i believe there are a lot of data sets available in india for free so adhal i i yeah. guess i've answered second question also in he he was he mentioned saying that data is gold and nobody is going to give it to you for free but uh, there are uh, companies that are giving data sets for free you just have yes, to mind government organization yeah there are government organization where they, uh, they they will give you there are excel sheets i mean maybe not in the right form how you are looking for it maybe it could be a shape file where you have to convert it through gis and then get it to your uh, uh, preferred software but but it is um i agree it's it's not going to be available uh, whatever you want but i think uh, you have to dig in deep in order to get 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 out, get the data yeah okay uh, so the next question that we have is from uh, lakshita singh uh, she is asking uh, is space syntax similar to ai or the, does it have any significant role in ai yes so uh, that's a good question so the space syntax was basically developed in uh, in ucl itself and it it is considered as one of the best uh, platforms for ai it is ai it is one of uh, uh, an algorithm that was created by the professors in ucl back in ucl and uh, it can analyze the space and it can bring out the spatial connectivity and everything uh, just by a couple of clicks it is ai yes that application is a is a goal for ai uh I, there is a similar question i think i'll just you know address to that as well aditya is asking aditya singh raj is asking how is ai and machine language different from space syntax methods and is there is it just digital interface and computational ease or a whole lot of dynamics is involved in the difference well there is actually a whole lot of dynamics that is involved in in that particular uh, space syntax it i was talking about the spatial connectivity there is also and then i was talking about the choice map as well it basically understand the space 
so i think uh, uh, to address your question uh, it is okay in the other applications let's say if i have to build a space syntax on rhino i can do that as well but it might not be that accurate as compared to space syntax because a lot of screening process has already been gone through it so it is much developed platform already available which is again open source anyone can use it by just downloading it it's called as depth map x so you can, you can download that and if you want to create your own uh, algorithm for the same you can do that as well but obviously it, it might not let's say it'll be just 60 to 70 percent accurate okay uh, we have another very good question from anshul gangwar he is asking that uh, what is the possibility of inaccurate uh, uh, input into the preliminary stage what are the dangers and in what can hello sorry can you sorry, sorry sorry yeah no no there was a voice uh, disturbance i couldn't i couldn't hear can you repeat that for me yeah sure uh, so the question is uh, what is the uh, possibility of inaccurate input into the preliminary stage and what are the dangers and in what ways can it affect the results okay that's a very good question actually so when we usually talk about data you can't really uh, depend on it let's say 100 percent so let's say you have uh, thousands or millions of data right you actually have to plot it on uh, there's basically a clustering analysis where again you take the data which is inaccurate so when you when you plot the data on x and y axis uh, you would have some data that are flying somewhere else in like somewhere in the xy world right and all the other data is actually uh, collected and it's, it's it's probably illustrated in in one zone and there are some some data that are probably somewhere in the air flying right you would know for the fact that these data is an inaccurate and you it is necessary that you get rid of those inaccurate data because it's gonna uh, alter your final result so these inaccurate data are basically called as outliers so they have to be removed in order to bring more authenticity to your data so that's one of the screening process that you have to do when you are analyzing data yeah, I guess once you screen the outliers, then uh, you the the possibility of incorrect or an inaccurate uh, outcomes is minimized. I hope that answers yes. your question, Anshul. Uh, the next question that we have is from Priyan Shajmera. Uh, he is asking, uh, what are could you refer to some reading resources and websites that can help uh, increase our knowledge on the topic? and it is called as machine learning for dummies hello can you hear me yeah yeah we can hear you Bish. hello yeah we can oh, hear you. sorry your screen went off so i thought i probably lost the connection again okay so i was saying there's a very good book and uh, it's, it's called as machine learning for dummies to be honest uh it's, it's, it's a goal. I mean, it's, it's really not meant for dummies. So don't go by the name. It will probably explain you how exactly to go about AI and architecture and everything in a very elemental way. So I think that is that is a very good find. The other one is you can look into the space. Uh, no, uh, OK, so in MIT, they have uh, SCL. That is uh, Sensible City Lab, SCL MIT. So that's one of the websites that I think you can look. They have a lot of projects that are uh, basically a lot of architectural projects where they have implemented AI and those are some really good case studies. Uh, there's another uh, uh, person, his name is Lev Manovich. Uh, he is basically doing all this research about big data and how it is morphing the urban uh, platform as well. So he is also another, another uh, I would say a person who is pretty good with this and I think you can definitely have a look at it. So I think this would help. I can probably share more in uh, references as well. Maybe later on, uh, maybe I can that, that'd share. Be great. That'd be great. If you can send us, uh, you know, a couple of resources that are available, I can forward it to our audience and uh, they can learn from it further. Great. That sounds good. I'll do that. Uh, so we have one more question from uh, so uh, we are wrapping up in just another five to ten minutes. So if anybody has any questions, please send it now. 
before we end, um, the next question is from Shishri Shivasar. Uh, she uh, is asking how much knowledge of programming is required to take on this path. Do you see this as the future of architecture? Okay, I'll answer the second part of the question first. Yes, I do see it as the future of architecture. Uh, sadly, architecture is one of the field which is a bit slow in incorporating AI because of X, Y, Z reasons, but I'm trying my best to incorporate this as soon as possible. The reason being, you have already seen uh, the leap in electronics, medicine, biotech, and everywhere possible, basically. So uh, these days we are into 3D printing and we're trying to make everything computationally sound. So I think AI is going to be the next future uh, eventually. And I'll be honest with you, it just took me, uh, I went to do my master's last year and that's when I was first exposed to the coding and uh, visual thinking. I mean, it's, there's, okay. So if you really want to start with AI, I would say instead of State straight away start with uh, scripting. What you can do is you can go for uh, visual coding. So Grasshopper is one of the initial tools which you can probably use. It is everything is like in form of components. So you don't have to script everything. You just have to identify the logic. And I think in couple of uh, weeks time you can you'll be able to do something which is which is which is let's say AI like based on AI. It is possible. I started uh, last September itself. So that was my first time, like that was my first exposure to uh, scripting and AI and Grasshopper and, and, and this this field basically. Great, great. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think uh, since the world is moving into the direction of AI, uh, the architecture and urban design domain is uh, should not be left far behind. And uh, exactly. I, the the um, the best uh, reason why we should switch ASAP is because uh, the amount of time we spend in uh, creating multiple options to a single solution is, is sort of like uh, is increased uh, in when we start using AI. Like you know, the time the time we, the time we spend ma to do it manually is way more in comparison to what a computer can do for us. Exactly, and and there are there are times when the the computer can give you the right solution as well. I mean, uh, I might stand here and like since I was giving uh, the examples of visual connections, you might feel that okay, if I'm standing here, I'll have the best visual connectivity. But you might be wrong. You actually have to run the simulation in order to understand which are the right spots where if I probably put my building there or if I put my tower there, I'll have the best uh, views of the city. You never know until unless you compute or probably if you have to do it manually it's going to take a lot of time for sure yeah i mean it it also depends on the scale of the project i believe if you're doing yes, a really yes. small scale project then uh yeah maybe you're able to sort of you know imagine all the spaces at the same time mm -hmm. but when you're looking at large scale projects it's kind of hard to imagine all of them together and uh, that is why speculative design comes into play and you know how a computer can speculate every single space simultaneously to give you the best output exactly that's i mean that's what i said computers are meant for computing that's their part that's their thing right like so i think you should leave that to them <laughs> and <laughs> what yeah that, that's the whole point okay uh, so we have one question from uh, professor vaibhav kulshesh he is asking that in the indian context how do you think uh, it is going to help urban design and urban planning in the near future okay so again i think it is quite uh, viable in indian context as well all you have to do is is to find the right set of parameters again you have to bring you have to ask computer the right questions you have to create the list of arguments that are suited for the Indian context. When we are talking about, let's say, the road width, what is the ideal road road width that we need in Indian context? It might differ from New York. It might differ from Amsterdam. It will probably differ from London as well. So your arguments, your questions, your uh, uh, list of parameters should be based on the Indian context specifically. And once we have the parameters, the result the final result would again be related to or probably something which is which would you can adapt it to the indian context as well so it's it's, yeah. it's all the game of it's all I the game of parameters 
same. I guess the <laughs> that's that's like a very uh, apt answer to Professor Weber. But I guess the process is the same. It's just that uh, your uh, logical sequencing will differ a little bit. Yes. Yeah, I I guess uh, so. We have uh, one more question from Aditya Singhraji. He is asking. How do you think we can apply the learnings of AI based studies and analysis in developing new products or apps in the market, uh, which are probably architecture related? Are there any emerging trends that you have spotted? Okay, hang on, I need to think. I think there are a couple of apps that are already there uh, where they are trying to uh, incorporate the logic of AI. And Fusion 360, these are uh, apps that are developed basically from the learnings of AI. Yes, exactly. And even uh, it might surprise you, but uh, Revit and AutoCAD are also one of the tools where you can actually uh, bring the AI understanding as well. These days, with every uh, release of the new software, even the software that were built on uh, like AutoCAD, it was first invented in 2007. They have there, there have been like multiple revisions on the software. So now, it is even possible to do the simulations on AutoCAD as well. You can do all the analysis where you have Autodesk. Uh, all the Autodesk softwares are basically compatible to each other. You can probably plug in your model into Ecotech and it will give you all the weather simulations. It will tell you how exactly the spaces are functioning in XYZ climate. So this is all here. Yeah. We are, it's, it's, it's as simple as that. We are already surrounded by it. I think software development domain is the one domain where AI is catching up real quick. Uh, yes. And uh, soon, I think once uh, people have ex excelled in that domain, there will be more simpler apps that might start coming into the market for designers because uh, obviously we are a creative brain and we sort of think a little less in comparison, like, you know, logically in comparison to programmers. Uh, so I get it. As you Slowly, we might uh, catch on quickly. Uh, there's one more question from uh, Tanka Baskar. She or he, I'm not sure, uh, is asking to differentiate between an architect's brain and machine machine intelligence in pro problem solving for space making. Sorry, could you please repeat the question for me? Your voice was, uh, I mean, there was a disturbance. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, they're asking you to differentiate between an architect's brain and machine learning, machine intelligence uh, in problem solving skills for space making architecture. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. So for uh, let's say talking about human intelligence and let's say a machine intelligence components, I think they we have to find the right balance between the two. You, no one can like probably ha have an upper hand until and unless, for example, when I gave an uh, example about housing complex based on your uh, arguments or based on your design concerns, you come up with a form. So oh, and in that particular state, a machine is helping you to develop a form, right? It'll tell you that, okay, I, I, you need a mask there, you need a form there, you need an open courtyard there. But again, that might not be the right, I mean, okay, it is the right answer based on the computer. But again, for example, you feel the aesthetics is different. If I remove this particular block as well, I can have even better connectivity. So it's the, so whatever the computer or the machine is giving you is, is never the final result. It is again, you have to go through a process where you analyze that design as well. You have to check if that is functioning or not. For example, if I stand here, if I sit here and if I want the maximum views, right? What computer would do is it'll remove everything that comes in my view in order to maximize the visibility, let's say. But that's not the yeah. solution. I want a building, I want I want a space there, I want a, a building mass there. Right? So it is again your problem solving skills where you need to identify that okay, how much building height or building size or building volume should be there in order to address to my my problem or my my design question. I hope that I I, I hope that answers the question. So it has uh, to be the balance of both. You really can't depend on a uh, machine in order to give you the right answer. It'll just do the analysis for you and the rest is your call and your take on how you solve that particular problem, how you take it forward. Yeah, I, I hope it answers your question, Tanka. If not, please let us know. Um, so uh, now this is a really cute question that we have from Bushra. Uh, she's asking, 
what are the challenges that you faced uh, while developing design through ai could you like elaborate on your personal experience a little more because i believe uh, she's a student and uh, maybe she can follow in your footsteps <laughs> okay so uh, thank you for your question and to answer i would say initially it is quite tough to understand or probably get into the state of mind where you can uh, depend on a machine in order to give you right answers first of all it is very overwhelming you 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 will probably find uh, as i said 100000 options you'll go crazy you'll be like i don't want 100000 options i'll pro i'm happy with 10 right but then again when you think upon it when you sit with it you will probably analyze okay so these are the option these are the options that you can negate you just have to focus on 5 and 6 i think the process is quite overwhelming so it probably takes a while to get in the state of mind where you can trust the options that a machine or an ai is giving you but again this is something that uh, comes along with time with the test uh, you really can't depend on depend for everything on a machine learning or or an ai application you have to have a belief or probably a, a let's say a problem solving technique on your designs as well so 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 those were the some of the initial dilemmas that i had and then uh, learning to code was probably the toughest thing that i i faced because we are designers we 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 think from uh, a very aesthetic point of view we are not coders we are not technically that sound compared to the other uh, fields right so to get again into that kind of situation where you are coding uh without rationally or without aesthetically aesthetically thinking about the design is was a, again a, a bit of a tough task to do but i think you'll get a hang of it it's is something that let's say a practice makes everyone perfect so that's that's the whole thing you have to be into it you have to give your 100% if you if you if you are really looking forward to it and then the results are good so i think i think it, it is worth doing it I guess let's just say that uh, how while studying architecture by the end of probably second year or first year you you it's in your muscle memory how to use a set square and a parallel bar so eventually you yeah. know if you start learning how to code it will just come into your brain the the language the scripting will you know immediately flow if you if you get get used to it so let's just hope that you know we can get uh, acquainted better on you know coding <laughs> so uh this i think this is the last question for the session we'll end after this uh can we in this is from uh, narneen zaidi uh, she is asking can we implement new concepts in architectural design like biomimicry using ai basic uh, basically be able to develop new concepts using ai oh yes definitely it is an open ended platform you can you're free to do anything that's the beauty of architecture i mean you're not bound by any restraints or any 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 boundaries it's it's is open ended platform so i think uh, whatever comes to your mind you can definitely uh, design you can have a whole new design theory or a language of your own of, of your own that's what zaha did came she 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 brought a uh, uh, fluid or let's say form active design into the field of architecture you might end up doing something different as well you never know so yes yeah that that's what anything it is, is like possible. speculative like you can speculate anything uh, once you know once you have yes. the right tools in your hand exactly uh, so is there anything else you should like to add for our students they are basically your uh, they they're in your lineage basically like so would you like to say something to them and end this session well uh, to start with i would say uh, for for everyone who is attending the webinar if you are curious and if you want to know more about uh, uh, this field of architecture uh, please do let me know i'll be happy to help uh, and i think it has got a potential and if you are able to probably incline your thoughts that way do your study do your homework uh, to google search what is happening i think exposure is one of the thing that uh, we all should be inclined towards AI is a concept of today. Maybe five years down the line, there might be something else. You never know. So I think it is important to know what is going around you. Read as much as possible. Explore. You're you're there. Like especially this time, it is great to be connected via webinar and like 
there are a lot of courses that are available online i think it is a very great initiative so keep doing that i think doing this is probably the right step or probably the right uh, way forward so so yeah kudos to that and stay home stay safe i think that's the that's the need of the r so yeah health is important rest everything can follow after that so thank you that's thank it you that's so it from much. my so much piyush for you know uh, speaking with us and uh, sort of uh, helping us overcome this stigma of uh, you know accepting ai in our lives uh, and simplifying it for all of us uh, thank you so much piyush we'd love to see you back in campus and do a workshop and do another session you know maybe physically present in front of everybody and then we can connect yeah, with everyone again. honestly i would love to do that and i am really looking forward to it and hopefully i will get to see you all soon take care uh, yeah you do you do you stay care and stay safe and uh, stay connected with us uh, in future as well and we'll see you again soon thank you piyush definitely have a good day bye bye okay bye 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 thank you participants the recording will be available soon on the same link uh, that you had used for registration so if you have missed out on any bits or any parts of the presentation you can view the recording probably after an hour thank you everyone thank you piyush again bye bye have a good day yes have a good day